We come now with the ninth lesson in our series of teachings on the gifts of the Spirit and their operation. This lesson is concerning the gifts of healing. And I pronounce the last word in the plural because that is really true, and I understand that it was so written in the original letters, manuscripts, and so it is true, though, anyway, because there are many, many healings, and there are differences uh, of the order of healing. There are healings that comes by the Word of God. There are healings that come through prayer. There are healings that come through faith, faith in action. Then there are healings that come just at the will of God, the Holy Spirit choosing the vessel, operating through the vessel with high spiritual gifts. This is the main point of our subject this morning, though we will give many things concerning the other order of healing. The gifts of healing are a supernatural power given by God, removing disease and infirmity. You know, the psalmist said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name, who forgiveth all my iniquities, and healeth all my diseases, or who healeth all my diseases. Healing is in the plan of God. It's in the very nature of God. It couldn't be God without healing in the full sense of the word, because from the beginning there was healing. We find Abraham on time of dealing with Abimelech. And Abraham had gotten himself into trouble because he did not come out uh, with the real whole truth to Abimelech about Sarah. And uh, many have found or sought to justify Abraham for not telling the whole truth. Others have condemned him very much for not telling the whole truth. But however that be, Abraham still got along all right with God. But the Lord certainly did have him rebuked about this thing of telling Abimelech that Sarah was his sister. He took her. She was evidently a beautiful woman, and he was going to have her. But God dealt with Abimelech. That shows us that God can deal with anybody. And I suppose Abimelech was quite a righteous person. He came before God and presented himself and his nation as righteous. But the Lord spoke to Abimelech about the matter, and he called for Abraham. He returned Sarah to Abraham, and Abraham prayed for Abimelech, and God healed him very sweetly and graciously. Hallelujah. So healing is in the very nature of of God. We're talking now at first this morning for a little bit about this uh, healing in God, the general healing to the church and to all people. My, my, many people get healed that not even serving the Lord. And you and I can do nothing about it. What we want to do is to be sure to serve the Lord and tell the people how the Lord will heal. And you know, Many people are saved, born again, that you and I might judge that, oh, no, they can't be saved until they do something about their ways. Well, we sometimes might forget that Jesus Christ died for the ungodly. And I'm glad that he did that. That let all people into the kingdom of heaven. So if God sees fit to heal just a rank sinner sometimes, well, that's his business. And it's mine your business to preach this gospel. That's exactly what we want to do. You know, healing was in the atonement mentioned by many. Where do you want to take this as the atonement?
atonement, healing being in the atonement or not, the same virtue in the scriptures for salvation is also for healing. Now, I would not try to put healing right up to a person that if you are not able to accept your healing, neither are you able to accept your salvation. I do not think that would be in harmony with God's truth at all. But nevertheless, you know, in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, and the fifth verse, that, that healing, with his stripes, we are healed. By his stripes, we are healed. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace is upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. And to show that healing is in this, when Jesus Christ came into the world, and he grew up, and when he entered into his ministry, healing was one of the first things that he did, right along with forgiving people of their sins, teaching them the truth. He healed them and brought many people to God by healing the sick. He did many mighty and wonderful miracles, even to people who had not yet seemingly accepted him fully as the Son of God, but they were uh, kind of spying around. They were seeing what they could see, and they found him to be really true. Now, in the fourth chapter of Luke, the Lord Jesus Christ tells us in the very nature of God and in the power of the gospel, in Jesus Christ working under the anointing of the Holy Ghost is healing. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are breathing, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Well, that anointing there was to heal, that anointing was to deliver, that anointing was to let a person, a captive, go free, and that means evidently a person who is in captivity by sin or by their conscience. You know a lot of folk are in captivity by their own conscience. They cannot get a liberty. They cannot get a freedom. You see people that are bound by certain traditions that they hold, and you could not get them to break it. And you'll find people who are bound by certain suspicions. And the little simple things in these suspicions, such as a black cat running across the path ahead of them, and uh, they turn around. They will not go any further. They're bound by this because it wouldn't make any difference whether it was a black cat or a white cat. It would have no bearing on you or me unless we got entangled with the cat. So let's do not think that any of these old imaginary things and suspicions and traditions that we've heard has anything to do with the power of God, of Jesus Christ's requirements for us to live before it. So, here this anointing, you know, it's by the anointing that we're delivered. In Acts 10, 38, it is written, uh, as Simon Peter said to Cornelius' house, he said, uh, you know about these things, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Now, that scripture is in the 18th verse of Luke, and the one that I gave from Isaiah was uh, 53, 5, and uh, another one in Isaiah where Jesus was reading from the scroll is 61, 1 and 2. It was written in the scroll back there about when the Messiah should come, what he would do, and it also had a judgment in it. Now, that judgment is yet future to you and to me. Jesus Christ is not passing out judgment. He came to save men. 
not to destroy them. And I'm so glad for that. You remember the incident of his wanting to stop, planning to stop in the cities of Samaria and uh, preach to them, heal the sick, do all these good things, cast out devils. That was naturally his work, and they wouldn't accept him. And then the two apostles asked permission or asked Jesus if he would like for them to call fire down from heaven as Elijah did. And Jesus told them, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. He said, I didn't come to destroy men's lives. I came to save. So he came to heal, too. Amen. There's healing in the church. And uh, this healing is tremendous. It's outstanding. You know, we're told this in James, the fifth chapter. I first said, if any man is afflicted, let him pray. And the first thing we should do is pray. Whatever we're afflicted with, whether it's a fever, toe heartache, anything, we should pray first. And then the second step there given by James, is any sick among you? Well, they would be afflicted with sickness, infirmities with sickness. And any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Pray ye one for the other, that you may be healed. So here's the real order. Now, many times we miss something real good. When we have prayed and we seem to not get a victory, not be delivered, we fail to do the next step that James told us to do. And this is in the church. It's committed to the church. And that is to call for our elders of the church. I remember one time when I was sick, and it just kept dragging. You know, I don't like to stay sick on. I like to get well real quickly. I imagine you do too. But I was quite ill. And my wife asked me why I did not call for the presidency and let them come and pray for me. Oh, you know, I did just like a lot of people do. I said, well, now, they're very busy. No need for me to have them to drive six miles over here and pray for me. But still, I did not get well. I couldn't throw this old sickness off. Now, I prayed, too. She prayed. Then one morning she said, why don't you do what you preach? You preach for people to call the elders of the church and tell them how they miss a lot of good things by not obeying the scripture. Here you are. You're not calling your elder. I said, okay, get word to them. Call them. When we called them, I was well when they got there. I obeyed the scripture, and I was well when they arrived. And, of course, they came in, and we all gave thanks. They still gave thanks to God for me did that which was the order of James' scripture, they anointed me with oil. And we carried that out as an act of faith, an act of obedience. We did not want to fail anything. He said, well, do you think that was necessary after that you were healed? I do not know. I couldn't just say that it was absolutely necessary. But I'll tell you one thing, it surely didn't do any harm. And it was in harmony with what James had said. So this is healing in the church, and we must carry on healing in the church, general healings. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ did a lot of general healings. You read the 12th chapter of Matthew, and you will find where they followed him and multitudes were healed because they came to him. We have another outstanding working of healing in obeying having action. The Lord wants action. There's one thing about it. You cannot find in the scriptures where it would agree with laziness, inactivity. The only person that is to be inactive is that person who is too sick, too feeble, their infirmities will not let them be active. 
then we're supposed to pray for them and, uh, and deliver them as God for the deliverance. And then two, you and I, ministers, definitely ministers, and it's not close to any saint, but it's certainly, definitely ministers. They are equipped with this power to work as it is written in Luke 10, 19, I have given you authority. The word there in our King James Bible is power, but it's different to the next word. To, over all the power of the enemy. Now, if we have authority over all the power of the enemy, and we do, we can break his power. We can destroy his power. I have repeated a number of times in these lessons, we cannot destroy Satan. You cannot. God didn't see fit to destroy Satan, and he certainly has not granted to us the power, authority, privilege, or anything to destroy Satan. Satan will be here until the Lord sends an angel to bind him and cast him into the bottomless pit. And I want to tell you, I want to be just exactly where the Bible tells us we'll be if we'll be faithful to the Lord at that time, and that's up there before God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We're looking for that. We're expecting that. But we cannot destroy Satan, but we can destroy his work. How many times we have prayed with people, even about someone in their family who was just being so bad, and they just come, so I'll tell you, they're just pressing me so, and being so mean, just looks like they're getting meaner. I know, as I pray for them, it seems that they get meaner than ever. And we'd pray and come against the power of Satan. Now, it's Satan that makes a sinner rise up and persecute Christians. Sure it is. And we'd come against that power, break that power, and many a person has gotten saved as a result of our breaking the power of Satan over them. So that's the authority in the church, and especially of those five who are serving in the five offices that Jesus Christ appointed to the church, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. But again, do not ever close your book and say that all saints are not privileged to also come and uh, through the mercies of God use these things, but they do not minister them as those who, are, who have been uh, chosen by the Lord Jesus Christ. You just find this in the Bible. That's the only reason I preach it. It's just simply in the Bible. But saints can do this. I remember an outstanding healer one time, our little boy, Charles David, was three years old, and uh, Uncle Jim Harris cut his hand with an axe. He was cutting uh, meat and uh, had butchered a yearling, and the axe handle hit something and caused him to cut his hand right across there. And he could not move his fingers here. Those fingers on that side. They just, he placed them down in his hand like this, wrapped his hand up after he could not move his fingers. And he came to town. He lived about three or four miles out of town. He came in, was going to the doctor, but he wanted to come by first for prayer. So he came to the parsonage. And he told us what was wrong, and he uncovered enough for us to see those fingers. He didn't show us the laceration over here. Or the and for us to see those fingers that he could not move them. He could move these others, but he could not move these. And you know, Charles loved Uncle Jim anyway. We called him Uncle Jim. He's no kin to us at all, but due to the other children of the family and our children with them, why, and that's we said Uncle Jim for the children's sake. And uh, he said, Uncle Jim, Jesus will heal you. And he jumped down off the divan and began to shout, jump. He just bounced like a little ball 
And he'd say, Uncle Jim, get the victory. Get the victory. And so we all started praising the Lord. And those fingers, when Uncle Jim <laughs> turned this wrapping back there with those fingers, he was, he was working with them. Well, you can say, well, that's kind of hard to believe, but that happened. That happened in 1937 in Wellington, Texas. And you could go there and find plenty of testimony to that very fact. God chose to deliver this man just through the anointing that he placed upon this little three-year-old boy. He was quite a religious little boy. He prayed. He rejoiced. He had praised the Lord. He preached. He loved it. And uh, so God just used him. Well, you know God can use a little boy or a little girl. You know, Samuel was called of God when he was just a small boy. You and I cannot put brakes on God. We cannot put guidelines on God and say, Lord, you must move along these lines. He does not have to move along any lines to suit us. But I'm so glad that he's so merciful to us and will do so many things for us even beyond our comprehension. Now that was one of these high quality deals and workings which God just chooses to do. That isn't a type necessarily that you pray for, pray about, while there was no prayer. Charles just said, Uncle Jim, Jesus will heal you. And he just started praising the Lord, jumping. He had the power on him. Well, that was God's choice to do that. Now, that's over in the bracket that I'll be in in a little bit. But I want to finish up here on some healings where people came to Jesus. You know, in the 8th chapter of Matthew, a man came to Jesus and asked him to heal his son. And Jesus said, all right, I'll go with you. And the man said, oh, no, 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 don't do that. I'm not worthy for you to come into my house. But he said, I know what you can do. He said, I'm a man under authority. I say to a servant, go, and he goes. And I say to one, come, and he comes. And he said, all you have to do is say the word. My son will be healed. Jesus said, you go. It's according to your word, according to what you have said. Then Jesus said to the people, he said, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. My, this is tremendous, tremendous faith. A little more, though, concerning our healing. Now, healing was given to Israel. I mentioned this back with Abraham and Abimelech. Then healing was given to Israel, promised to Israel by the Lord, even before the law was given. You go to the 15th chapter of Exodus and read it, and the 26th verse tells us this about healing. If thou wilt diligently hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear unto his commandments, and uh, keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Now there was healing to Israel. And this was before the law was given. It was, it was several days after this, before they got to the mount where Moses then dealt with them and went up to the mount and received the law came back and gave it to them. So here's healing. But they had something to do here, and we in spirit do the same thing, even in uh, some action. But this was to Israel. But all they had to do was to hear God's voice. Of course, a little later, when the Lord wanted to talk with them, they ran back and didn't want him to. They said, Moses, you let him talk to you, and you tell us. Well, of course, that cut them off from a lot of things that evidently Israel would have had had they gone on and listened to the Lord as he talked to all the congregation. But here, 
is for them to diligently hearken. And you and I need to do that. But in the New Testament, let's just go and see how this promise is ours and how it will work to us. Turn to the first chapter of Second Corinthians and reading the 18th verse, we have this. In the 18th, ver uh, 18th verse, I believe it is, uh, he said, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, that was preached unto you by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. Yeah, that's the 19th verse. The 20th verse, listen to it. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. All right, this promise in Exodus is ours. For what? For believing Jesus Christ. For taking those statements of Jesus Christ, that all the promises of God in Jesus Christ are yea and amen to us. And he is glorified through the things that work in us. You know, if we do not receive the healings, there's no glory to God in our being sick. I know sometimes people think, well, the blind man was blind to the glory of God. No, the glory of God was in the works of God. This blind man was blind in, in the ninth chapter of John, and Jesus certainly corrected their error on thinking that either the man had sinned or his parents had sinned, caused him to be born blind. Well, it's not reasonable that anyone sins before they're born, but we have a lot of theories in the world, you know. But one thing about it, Jesus corrected them on the thought that his parents' sin would cause him to be born blind. The only way we would get such results from the sin is what we're taught by science, medical science especially, uh, you know, that our conduct and our ways, diseases of our bodies and so forth, will certainly have an effect upon the offspring. Sure, those things come in. But Jesus was letting them know that just sin, as people were living out of the ark of safety, would not cause one to be born blind or deformed and all of these things. That is the direct sin of that person. But he said this is to the glory of God. And he said, I work the works of God while it's day. God was glorified in the works. So Jesus sent the man on scene. And here it turned out to his glory. Well, now here in 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, 20th verse, and all the promises of God in him are yea and in him, amen, to the glory of God by us. It has to come through us. So here are all of those promises. You know, there's another great promise there in Exodus. This was after the law was given. Still just as good as the first one. And that's in Exodus 23, 25. And thou shalt serve the Lord thy God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water. And I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. I know a man who was a Christian preacher, pastor, and then he was filled with the Spirit, and he suffered greatly from stomach trouble, and he took this scripture and went to God and said, Lord, that midst means the middle or the inwards, and he said, this is right in the middle of my body, and God healed him. When he asked him to heal him, God healed him, made him ever with whole. That's wonderful in general healing. Hallelujah. I'd like to give another testimony here about some healing that had to do with some works. And uh, James, you know, tells us that faith without works is dead. There has to be faith, I mean, has to be works 
along with faith. If you and I get saved, see, he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him, so there's some faith. But if we do not do something about coming to God, we'll just stay out there. There are works. James mentions this in the second chapter four times. In the 14th verse, the 17th verse, the 20th verse, and the 26th verse, he mentions about works being associated with faith or it is dead if there are no works. So I remember when Charles was a great teenager, he, the, he brought down the yellow jungles. And the way it was first observed, he became tired. He was very active. He was a very alert boy all the time. He was moving all the time. But he became inactive. He became uh, where he wanted to just lie around and pursue a notice. He began to get yellow. And that just kept coming. Of course we prayed. And uh, I do not know about other uh, getting any other minister, but we certainly requested prayer. And we prayed, and he kept growing sicker. And one Sunday evening after church, he was so sick. And wife said something to me about his being just real sick. I had heard many people say about they went before God and told the Lord, I'm going to stay all night before you or receive an answer. Now, I have prayed a number of times all night. I do not know whether I did a lot of good by just praying all night, whether I was really praying in faith or just toughing it out. You know, when you pray, pray and mean it. Jesus said, God's not interested in you much saying. He's inter interested in you saying something in meaning. So, anyway, I said to her, I'm going back over to the church and pray, and uh, I I'll stay over there all night. Or if I did not say those words to her, I said them to myself. And I walked into that church, and I said them to the Lord. I said, now, Lord, I'm going here to prayer in behalf of Charles David, and I'm going to pray all night or get an answer. And I went to pray. And I prayed for him. And I prayed in general. I suppose I prayed for everything I could think of. But I ran out somewhere around uh, 1 or 1.30 or 2 o'clock. I just ran out of anything to say. And I thought about, now the Lord's not interested in my much saying. I got up, sat down on the altar bench, and I talked to the Lord a little bit. I said, Lord Jesus, when you were here, you told us for us not to be as the heathen, just a repetition of sin. And I said, I have run out of anything to say. I told you that I was going to stay here all night or get an answer. But there's no need for me just to stay here and just repeat. I don't believe that I'm doing right. And so I got up and went across to the parsonage. When I walked in, I walked through Charles' room and right into his wife's room, and I asked her about it, and she said, he's kind of delirious. And uh, you know, that hit me in the heart. I felt like we were in no man's land. And I mean by that, this. In a place that if we were to turn to the doctor now, he'd say, you waited too late. And... Uh, if we did not get a deliverance from God, we're, we've lost everything. So I turned to walk out of the room, and the Spirit of the Lord spoke to my heart and said, Ask your wife to forgive you for every time you have just kind of walked off and ignored answering her something that she was talking with you about and asked you about. We'd just be in conversation, and rather to go on with it, Maybe I'd walk away. I didn't act 
ugly, as far as I knew, on I just walked away. What I mean, I did not have an ugly spirit about it, I didn't think. But anyway, the Lord said that to me. You think I didn't obey? I turned quickly. I walked in there. I asked her to forgive me. She said, I have not noticed you're doing that. I said, yeah, but the Holy Spirit had. Or rather, Jesus had, because the Holy Spirit does the things for Jesus. And uh, then she said, and I want you to forgive me for every time there's been harshness in my voice. So that time, she was up and we were walking in through the doorway and the child's room. And he raised up in the bed and said, I want you to forgive me. I want the Lord to forgive me. I haven't been wanting to mind. And did you know God healed that little boy right then and there? He got up off of that bed, and he said, I'm hungry. And you know, now with this sickness, yellow jaundice, you do not want to eat. And uh, eating is a help to overcome the disease, they tell me. But you get to where you do not want to eat, and he was in that place. He just didn't want anything to eat. But now, when he was healed, he said, I'm hungry. We went in and prepared him everything that he would mention. I'll tell you, we prepared him a breakfast somewhere around 3 o'clock, and that was fit for a king. Amen. <laughs> and uh, we all went to bed then, rested till up in the morning, 7 or something. Got up, and that day we went visiting. He was playing, he was alert, his energy was back, just doing great up in the morning at the place where we were visiting, somewhere around 11 o'clock, after he'd been out playing, playing about an hour, he came in. And I already had it in my spirit. The Lord was already speaking to my spirit. And uh, I had even asked the people to kneel with me in prayer. And just about the time we got through praying, Charles came in. And he wanted to lie down. I knew what was wrong. You see, he was still just as yellow as ever. His eyes yellow. His skin actually looked almost green. I walked out to a little shed out back of their house where they had some feed. Got in there and I got down to praying and when I put my head down, I was so heavy in my soul I could hardly bear it. But when I would look up, that would all lighten up. And I saw immediately what the Lord wanted. He wanted some praises and thanksgiving. I put my hands up and began to thank, thank him for having healed Charles, praising him, and my hands would hit the top of the little building. So I walked outside, and I walked around praising the Lord a little bit, and a song hit my heart. I walked back in the house singing that song, and Charles was getting off the bed, went back to play, and he never had any more agenda. God has a marvelous way of working things. Let's give our ear to him. If thou wilt diligently hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. This was in this promise for healing to Israel back in the book of Exodus. And you and I have to give attention. And when you and I have something searching us out that is fact, Let's give attention to it. Now, if something is telling you there might be something wrong, you say if there were anything wrong, it would not be a might be. The Holy Spirit would make me to know what it is. Don't let the devil defeat you, overcome you, destroy your faith and testimony on telling you now there's something that you're not doing that you ought to do. When we go to God and say, Lord, I want to do your will, I'll take your will from the Word of God, I'll also take anything the Holy Spirit will give me and press into my spirit, I will obey it. And if he didn't give us then something that we were doing that was hindering us, he wouldn't be the Father to us that he said he would be. Jesus would not be the high priest to us that he said that he is. And a lot of people are defeated by um, 
imaginary forces in their spirit. Listen to the Apostle Paul in the 10th chapter of 2 Corinthians when he said, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but what are they? They are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So use that weapon. That old, wep uh, that old stronghold of that human imagination, use a weapon to destroy. But now in all of these healings, and wonderful things. You know the woman that pressed through the crowd, the fifth chapter of Mark, and she pressed through to touch Jesus' clothes. As she had said, if I may but touch his clothes, I'll be ever with whole. This was a woman with the issue of blood that had been to doctors, and uh, doctors are wonderful, they're good, but there are a lot of things they can't handle that God can still handle. Hallelujah. And a lot of things that they can handle that God will still handle for us. Sure. But she knew she could touch Jesus' clothes. I want you to see here there was some works with her faith. She did something about it. She pressed through that crowd. And she touched him. And he recognized that there had been a touch that drew virtue from him. And I'm not going through all the story, but I want to tell you one thing. At the end of that story, it is written. For she said, if I may but touch his clothes, she said something, and then she put herself into action about it. Hallelujah. She got to his clothes. She could have, have, have sat back here and repeated over and over, if I could just touch his clothes, I, uh, oh, if I could only touch his clothes, and never would have anything happened. But she said, if I may but touch his clothes, as ah, she went through that crowd. Brother, sister, God wants action. And we are to give him action in faith. Hallelujah. All right, let's come to some of these healings now that just seemingly come without any effort on our part. Now, in Psalms 107.20, it is written, he sent his word and healed them, and delivered them from their destruction. He sent his word and healed them. We are healed by the word of God. We are saved by the word of God. But he sent his word and healed them. Well, let's pick up a few cases. Let's take John, uh, John's Gospel, the fifth chapter. Let's see a man here. This man, all right, was putting forth an effort. He had faith, but he couldn't receive healing. And the reason he could not receive healing was because he had no one present to put him in this pool. That is, no one was paying any attention. There were plenty of people present because this pool had five porches, and each one uh, was filled with impotent people, sick, afflicted, and all kinds. But no one would help this man. And you know Jesus walked down. Of course, I like to picture him as having walked all around, all five porches. Whether he did that or not, I don't know. He might have gone straight to the one the man was in. Who knows? It isn't written there. But one thing about it, he went to this man. And he just walked up to him and asked, Will thou be made whole? The man said, I do not have anyone to help me. When this water is troubled, I have no one to help me to get in, and someone else always gets in ahead of me. Jesus said, take up your bed and walk. There was no effort on the man's part. No one else was praying for him right then and there. Jesus just said, take up your bed and walk. Those things are happening today. This is this gift of healing now that we're talking about here in the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Let's read it. To another faith, by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings, by the same Spirit. To somebody, gifts of healings are given. Now, sometimes that person might pray when they know they have in their spirit the very workings of the gifts of healing to take to someone. 
Faith and healing works together. I mean, that's high faith many times. And sometimes one will work uh, without the other. Uh, we gave the testimony about the little baby that was to die and had been sent back from Dallas, Texas to Greenville to the home. No more they could do for it. They knew there was no cure. And God gave my wife healing virtue for the healing of that baby. She evidently had faith too because she went by and told the mother, instructed the mother what to do where the mother was working, went out to the grandmothers, and while we were all talking, while my faith wasn't a, a, a sixteenth of an inch high, I just didn't have any faith for, for that child because of the grandmother was a great church worker, a wonderful church worker, but she had no faith in these things. And somehow or other, I'll let her hinder me. And you can do that, and you should. I should not have done that. I should not have uh, been moved by it. I knew my wife had the thing in her spirit, and she kept saying, let's pray. She just said a little short prayer. We got up and walked out. I said, I'll tell you if there was anything done. It certainly wasn't on my face. She said, I made his healed. You see, healing and faith were working together. No, really, I believe I should state that, and I failed to do this. Knowledge, the word of knowledge, because the Lord made her to know by word of knowledge about these things and the condition of that little child, though we had heard some of it by the ear. But by the word of knowledge, and then carried healing with it. But I suppose all three was working in her right at that time. So this is that high quality. You do not have to seek God for it. You do not have to pray all night for it. You do not have to anoint with oil for it. You do not have to do anything but state it. Ministry. Hallelujah. And it's wonderful. That's the highest gift of healing that we know anything about. I'll tell you where a record is then, after the days of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus Christ performed this a number of times to show what the Lord do. Now, Jesus was not doing this work as the Son of God. He was doing this work as a man, the Son of Man, anointed with the Holy Ghost. The same anointing that you and I have. The same person of the Godhead that you and I have. So, after Pentecost, there was a man named Aeneas. And so Simon Peter went into his house. Simon Peter was in this era. And he went into his house. It is written, and this you'll find in the ninth chapter of Acts of the Apostles, and the exact point is the 33rd verse. But it is written here in this account that this man had had his bed for eight years. Simon Peter just walked in there and said, Aeneas, Jesus Christ, make you whole. And up he came. I want to tell you, when it comes like that, no human being has anything in it except the vessel that the Holy Spirit had chosen to minister this healing through. Oh, how great and how far a past finding out are these great and marvelous workings of God. No wonder Paul wrote that to us about these things, about how God was going to bring Israel back in, and then said that how, far, how great and how far past finding out these mighty and true workings are. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it great? We need to present ourselves and just be ready. We cannot produce one of these workings from ourselves. I have mentioned already, you might as well give up the idea that you're going to fast and pray until you have some of this working. It will not bring it. It'll be like the woman was that we knew one time. Her husband wouldn't get saved. He was an officer of the law. And I guess he let that hinder him a lot because he was a real friend to the church. Uh, we were not pastoring this church. But she told us about it, and she just got so, I guess, aggravated, would be about the best word, 
One morning they were going to church and she, like many good companions, good wives, or sometimes a husband, I don't think we husbands do as much to try to get the wives saved as the wives will do to try to get their husbands saved. If that were the case, because my wife got saved first. But anyway, she told us about, they were on the way to church, and, and uh, on the farm there, they had these wire gaps. He got out to let a gap down, and she drove through. And as he got out, she said, I'm going to fast and pray for you till you get saved or I die. Bless your heart, she started in, and the first time that it had ever hurt her for fasting. I believe is about the second day that woman got so sick, she had to go to the hospital. But that taught her a lesson to never say again, I'll fast till I die, or see a certain thing done. You don't get it that way. Now, fasting is taught by Jesus Christ. It is mentioned and taught by the Apostle Paul. The time is not given at all. There are some accounts of time that people fasted. Jesus fasted 40 days, nights, and all of these things. But Paul was often fasting, evidently not too long at the time. So fasting is in good order. But here are some healings that came irrespective of what the person was doing or thinking. You know, you might just be anywhere. And it might just come into your spirit. Why, you could be visiting with people and all at once you have something revealed to you to do uh, that I, I'm going to heal someone over here. And you just go and minister that. That's all you do about it. That's all you say about it. That is this high quality, quality gifts of healing. I've noticed in prayer lines, when people would be praying, and uh, for people just, I mean a minister, be praying for people that just becoming great lines, and all at once he'd stop with someone. And when he told that someone the Lord would heal them, they were healed just like that. You'll notice that if you'll watch these prayer lines. That is when this high quality healing moves through this one that is being used as a vessel. Oh, it's wonderful. The marvelous mysteries of God. Hallelujah. I jotted down a thought or two here about other things in this high quality healing that I didn't want to miss this morning as I give it to you and I trust that it will be a real blessing to you. I remember when a woman who had fallen and she had broken ribs and she was high up in the age bracket. And I happened to be in the hospital when the Lord had sent me to pray for a man, or that is to tell him that he wouldn't have any more trouble. He had had a serious attack. And I just went in and asked him about how things are going. He said, well, I thought it was getting along all right, but I had some kind of an attack and they won't let me go home. They were getting ready to let him go home. I walked over in front of him, and I said, you will not have any more trouble. They let him go home before night. Well, at that time, he told me then about seeing that his people come in. Well, I knew about this woman having broken her ribs. She fell one night. So I w went down, checked, found the room she was in, and went see, and her daughter was in there with her. And so the daughter told me, that they couldn't tape her, her mother, because they feared pneumonia. And it just hit my spirit to go over and tell her that she would not have pneumonia. I walked over there to her and uh, called her name and I said, uh, you won't have any pneumonia. She said, I don't believe that I will. I said, no ma'am, you won't. I know that you won't. Well, a few mornings after that, her daughter was talking with my wife, and this woman had a voice that would carry all over the room on the end that the other person was on, on the phone. She had a voice to carry. And of course, I heard it. And I heard her tell my wife 
that the doctor feared pneumonia, that her mother's lungs was, uh, they were filling with fluid, and so he feared pneumonia. I said, tell her that she can't have pneumonia, that that is nothing in the world but a trick of the devil trying to come in and scare them, frighten them about this matter, and make them give up their faith. That woman cannot have pneumonia, and she did. How did I know that? Not because I had such super-duper faith, but because the Holy Spirit had given that to me by the supernatural working of every one of these things, this whole order of the nine gifts of the Spirit recorded here in the twelfth chapter of First Corinthians. Oh, again. How wonderful, even as it is written in the 107th Psalm. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. I'll tell you, God's good to us. Pray. Now, since the Lord said, Inasmuch as you are zealous of spirituals, seek that you might excel to the edifying of the church, and again, to seek the best gifts. All right, let's seek them. The best gifts. To be in the church. Amen. This is the end of our ninth lesson on gifts of healings. Our next lesson will be kinds, I mean, will be prophecy. Amen.